bit different. Um, I'm going to ask you to stand again, please. The reason for that is it is symbolic. When we stand, it is symbolic that we as a group are united together as we are about to go before the Lord and we are going to pray for Longview Missionary Baptist Church. And we're going to pray for Ryan Carlisle's family. He's the youth pastor that passed away. He has a wife, Bridget, and two young children, Ava and Max. And uh, this is part of what it means for us to be the body of Christ, which is what we're going to talk about this morning, is that we stand with one another as we suffer and as we rejoice. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we declare, we remember that you are good and that you are loving. Lord, we will be reminded this morning in scripture that you do the work of bringing each local congregation together and you have done the work of bringing this congregation together this morning. And you have done the work of bringing Longview Missionary Baptist together this morning. And these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are grieving. And so we as one body stand before you and appeal to your love, your grace, and your mercy. That you would bring healing into the life of this church. That you would bring comfort. Lord, for Bridget who is now a single mom with two young children. Lord, give her strength. Give her comfort. Lord, help her know how to talk to her children about what has just happened in their lives. Lord, always, in everything, what we seek is your glory. What we seek is that people would look at our lives as individuals and our lives as a community of believers and say, there is something so remarkable about them, it can be only explained by the presence of Jesus in their lives. Or that is what we pray for Longview Missionary Baptist this morning and in the months and years ahead as they wrestle with the grief of losing someone that was so integral in their lives. And Lord, give us wisdom as a church and as individuals who know these folks to know how to love them well and support them in the incredible work that you are doing through that church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, You're not all done standing up. If you were in VBS, either as a kid or as a worker, would you stand up and stay standing? We had a phenomenal VBS this past week. And it's not just because kids had fun. It's because God was glorified. Do you want to know something else that happened? Our VBS raised over $1,000 for helping Christian children in Pakistan who are not able to go to school to be able to go to school. They are doing the work of, of planting a school, creating a school for Christian children. And this group that you see standing here was a huge part of that in raising over $1,000 for those people. God is at work here. God is at work here. God is at work in Pakistan. God is at work around the world. Okay, you guys can be seated. Okay, but kids, you're not off the hook. I'm immediately putting you to work. Who's this? Mr. Potato Head looks remarkably like me, um, except he has better hair. Um, who here has ever played with Mr. Potato Head? Out, outstanding. Okay, now this is time for honesty. 
Um, who here has ever put together Mr. Potato Head in ways he was not supposed to be put together? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I can relate to that, right? I can absolutely remember trying to be Dr. Frankenspud. And I would create some sort of crazy monster potatoes. Now, you look at these two potatoes, do you realize how frustrating it would be for the two of them to have a conversation? Think about this for a second. The potato on the left can talk, right? He has a mouth. The potato on the right would only hear half of what is said because he only has one ear. And then it goes downhill. The potato on the right can't answer back because he doesn't have a mouth. And it wouldn't matter because the potato on the left doesn't have any ears, so he or she wouldn't be able to hear anything anyway. And you know what? That reminds me of some relationships that I know. One person talks a lot. The other one half listens, but never says anything back. And it doesn't matter because the first person isn't listening anyway. So... Of course, it's not all that's wrong with these potatoes. Um, the potato on the left isn't going anywhere. It's missing at least one foot. It's hard to tell if that other foot is attached or just kind of near him. Um, he's also missing an eye. You could say he's missing an arm, although he knows where it is. It's just of no use to him. And I don't even know what to say about the potato on the right. right? He has two hands, but one of them is clearly misplaced. It might be good for something like scratching his back or reaching up on shelves, but other than that, it's kind of useless. Could you imagine how frustrating life would be for both of these potatoes? Just doing the daily stuff of potato life would be incredibly hard and it would be incredibly frustrating. I could imagine after a while they would get very, very angry. You could say that they would get fried. And let's close in prayer. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting the way that people talk about church, the way people think about church, can look a lot like these two potatoes. You might think that one part is the only part that matters, and so we put that part on the top of its head and we elevate it and glorify it. Or we might think that there's a particular part that doesn't matter, right? Who needs feet? And that kind of thinking in the church leads to incredible frustration. You have people who are uninvolved. They might not think they have anything to offer, but in fact, they are deeply, deeply needed. And then you have people who are right on the edge of burnout. And very often it's because they carry the burden of thinking that everything depends on them. Today's passage challenges both of those misconceptions. We're continuing our series called Define the Relationship. And during this series, we are looking at who the church is and what it's supposed to be about. It's looking at what has the Bible called us to be and what has the Bible called us to do as the local church. And we've seen that Jesus is the one who built the church. It's not our work, it's his. And then in week two, last week, we saw that the church is pictured as a family. There is an intimacy that comes because we have a shared identity in Christ. And this week, we're going to look at the image that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it's the image of the church as a body. Now, we often use this terminology, in fact, I did this morning, just a second ago, intentionally, to refer to the universal church, all Christians who are everywhere, in any place, in all of history, and that is perfectly appropriate. But what I want us to catch is that Paul uses this terminology, local church. Everything that Paul says here, he applies specifically to this church in Corinth. And that means it applies specifically to the church of Fellowship Bible Church. Paul's point is that God is assembling this local church in a very particular way. Every part is needed. Every part has something to do. 
If we do not see the body of Christ as expressed in the local church as needing everyone, then that church is going to suffer and so will the individuals within the church. Now, Paul lays this out in 1 Corinthians by first showing the radical nature of the oneness that the Lord is building. He then identifies two threats to that oneness, and then he addresses the work that is supposed to happen because of that oneness. And finally, we're going to wrap up by looking at the implications for FBC. But Paul starts in verses 12 and 13 by addressing the radical nature of our oneness. Now, what makes the oneness of the church radical is how different its members are. Greeks and Jews were not just culturally different. They saw themselves as morally different. And this was especially true coming from the Jewish side. When it talks about Greeks, it's not talking about specifically people from Greece. That was a way of referring to anyone who was a Gentile. In other words, a non-Jew. And remember that the Jews considered Gentiles impure. They would not even enter the house of someone who is a Gentile. They were very hesitant to touch something that a Gentile would touch because of the moral and spiritual implications. Jews, on the other hand, had practices that alienated themselves from the broader culture. And in fact, they were very likely to be considered unpatriotic. That sounds weird. Why? Because what is something a Jew is never going to do? A good Jew is never ever going to bow to Caesar as a god. And yet bowing to Caesar as a god was a sign that you were a good citizen, a good patriot in that culture. Now, slaves and free were obviously socially different. They would be economically very different. The free were the powerful. The slaves were the powerless. Think about this for a second. There would be people gathered in that local Corinthian church who were owned by other people who were gathered in that church. In that culture, there is nothing equal about them. Yet look at a word that Paul repeats five times in these two verses. He uses the word one. They are one body. The Holy Spirit made them and continues to make them one. Paul's point is that there is no way this group of people belong together, but they are together. They are one, and it's by design. Some of you are familiar with this. This is called the Evil Elvis. It is from a donut shop in Dallas called Hypnotic Donuts. And if you have never been there, your life is not yet complete. The evil Elvis has banana, honey, peanut butter, and bacon, all slapped on a glazed donut. Oh, you have that reaction. Everyone has that reaction at first. This is something that should not exist. Who in their right minds thinks to themselves, let's put banana, honey, peanut butter, and bacon on a glazed donut, and that's a good thing. But you want to know this is one of the most popular donuts that's in Dallas? These ingredients should not work together, but they do. And there are a number of people I know in this church and can point them out, and I'm looking at one of them right now who's had one. And they are an experience. <laughs> That's how it is with the church. The ingredients should not go together, but they do. One more observation about this radical oneness. Do you see that at the end of the verse 12, he calls this body Christ? Not just the body of Christ, but Christ. He is saying that the church is so closely identified with Jesus that when people look at the church, they are to see the very presence of Jesus. 
You see, the stakes are high for our radical oneness. It's not just about how we get along. It's not just about an inward focus that makes us feel good. It's about a radical oneness that makes the presence of Jesus tangible in a culture that desperately needs him. As Paul continues, starting in verse 14, unfortunately, there are two threats to our oneness. And Paul outlines these in 14 through 26, and that's a long section, but it really naturally divides into two parts. And each part deals with a subtle but very, very dangerous threat to oneness. The first section is in verses 14 through 20, and it addresses people who feel left out or excluded. It deals with people who think they don't need me. These are the people who are in danger of isolating themselves from the rest of the body. And here's what Paul describes in these verses. One body part looks at itself and says, well, I'm not that other body part, so I really don't have a place in the body. You know, the foot says, I'm just a foot. I can't get a grip. I don't belong. The ear says, I'm just an ear. I can't see how I belong. That's dad jokes. That sounds crazy, but we do these things all the time, right? I look at some of the people in the church. I, I, I look at a, at a Lawrence Law or a David Fisher or, or a Tom Ames or others and think they can do incredible things with their hands. They can build things. I, I look at a Melissa Sweet or, or a Randy Anderson and they have incredible artistic talent. And if you know me, you know that if you gave me a ruler and a month, I could not draw a stick figure. If you gave me a hammer and a nail, somebody is going to the hospital. (laughs) And I look at these people and I think, what do I have to offer? They must think I'm a total dork. But there are others who look at someone with musical gifts or someone who's comfortable in speaking in front of people or someone who has incredible wisdom to counsel people, and they think, what do I have to offer? And Paul has an answer. Paul's response to the foot and to the ear and to us is, that would not make it any less a part of the body. The fact that you feel like you aren't important, the fact that you feel like you have nothing to offer, doesn't change the truth. You are, in fact, important. Each part is necessary. God chose how to put the body together. You can say all you want to that you don't have a place, but Paul's response is that God is the one who put you together in a particular way. He gave you specific experiences. He gave you unique personality and unique talents, and he has placed you in this place for a reason. So don't talk yourself into thinking that you don't matter. Starting in verse 21, Paul turns the situation around and he looks at other people in the church who might say about someone, we don't need you. These are the people who are in danger of burnout. They are the ones who think it is up to them to carry the weight of the church. And you know what? It doesn't matter how important or gifted you think you are. Even if you think that you're as important to the body as the head is to the body, you cannot say to any other part of the body that you are not necessary. Remember who Paul is writing to. It's a mix of Jews and Gentiles. It's slaves and free people. You see, the slaves and the poor were the dishonorable in that society. Paul's point is that in the church, there is no such thing as a dishonorable. It doesn't matter if someone is flashy or not, wealthy or poor, multi-talented or not. Every part of the body is given honor by God. And it says in verse 24 that God composed the body. The word literally means to bring unity by mixing various parts. Think of your favorite song. Think of all the intricacies in that song, the different instruments that are brought together. And depending on the style of song, that might include uh, wind instruments. It might include brass instruments. It might include string instruments. It might include percussion. And you know what? If you took any one of those pieces and played just that part of the song, just their part of the song, it would sound incredibly incomplete. It might even sound bad. 
but you take all of those pieces that cannot stand on their own and you bring them together and the writer, the composer of the song has created something beautiful, powerful, and moving. And that is what Paul is picturing that God does with the church. He creates something beautiful, powerful, and moving when he brings together all of these different pieces that society might think are just absolutely worthless. They may not be influential. They may not be important people, but they have been composed into the body of Christ. Everyone has honor for a reason, verses 25 and 26 say. And they have honor for the reason, first, that there would be no divisions, and second, that the church would care for one another. And as we continue to do with Longview Missionary Baptist Church, we suffer when they suffer and we rejoice when they rejoice. But far more tangibly, that is to be what happens within this body. We suffer when one another suffers and we rejoice when one another rejoices. And that is because there is no one here that is less important or less honorable than anyone else. And let's be honest. Christians do not often experience the oneness of the body of Christ in the way that this passage describes. And that is because both threats run rampant in churches today. There have been times in my life when I have caught myself thinking, I've served my time, now it's time for someone else to serve. And there are lots of versions of that. You'll hear things like, I worked at my past church, I just came here to enjoy. Or you might hear someone say, I spent years serving others, it's time for others to serve me. And very often, not always, but very often, there is a graciousness that's behind that. It's someone who is stepping out of their way to allow others to enjoy the blessings that they had when they served. But do you catch the problem assumption that is underneath those types of statements? The assumption is that they don't have anything important to offer now, that the, that the church does not need them now. But Paul says, no. You are necessary to the church where and when God has placed you. Do you ever catch yourself thinking something like, wow, that person would be a great addition to the church? I hear it all the time. It's always meant as a compliment. It's a sincere recognition that the person brings something wonderful to the church. But I think Paul would challenge us to see everyone. Like that, to see everyone through the eyes of what a great addition they are to the church. You know, if there's someone that you can't see as a great addition to the church, maybe that's something you go to the Lord about and pray. Lord, open my eyes. I'm going to give you one more. And I think this is important because of the mix of people that we have in here this morning. Do you ever hear people say, the youth and the children are the future of our church. No, they are not. They are the present of our church. They are every bit as much of this body as anyone else is. And our role in their lives is going to look different from our role in the lives of someone who's an encore. We're going to ask different things of them. They're going to need us in different ways, but they have gifts. They have been placed here by God for a reason. They are every bit as much of the presence of the church as anyone else. And guess what? I don't care how old you are, you are every bit as much of the future of this church as anyone else. A quick aside, usually when I hear someone say that about the youth or children, what they are um, really doing is trying to motivate me. Very often through, or motivate whomever, very often through 
guilt or um, inspiration or something like that. And you'll hear them all often say, the church is only one generation away from disappearing. What's the problem with that thinking? Who builds the church? Christ. The future of the church is not in our hands. It is in Christ's hands. We have roles. We have responsibilities. And that is Paul's point in these verses. But it will not be up to us. It will be up to Jesus to determine what will happen as we fulfill those roles. We need to stop putting that type of burden and guilt on one another by saying it is up to us. Paul wants the body, the church, to be healthy, to function well. And this only happens if the body is united in a radical oneness. And radical oneness only happens if every member of the body recognizes his or her importance and the importance of others. Let's make sure we say about everyone. What a great addition to the church they are. The oneness of the body of Christ also shows God at work, and it shows us at work, which is how the passage ends. God's work has actually been stated in different ways throughout the passage. We saw in verse 18 that God arranged the body. In verse 24, we learned that God composed the body. And it's stated again in verse 28. Here it says God appointed the gifts in the church. And the word appointed literally means to set something in its place. God set each of you in this place for a reason. I heard an amazing story after church on Sunday. Craig Ward of Monday uh, tracked me down. And he shared the story of a co-worker of his when he was working in Detroit. And this co-worker was from China and had come to Christ in China as an adult. And his boss was really crucial in leading him to Christ and discipling him. And so when it came time for this engineer, this young believer, to move from China to North America... This boss, this mentor of his said, let me tell you what you're going to do when you get to North America. You're going to find a church and you're going to get involved. And then he said, here's what I want you to do. Here's how you find a church. You look up what the church believes and you make sure that they are doctrinally correct. And you're going to find several of those that are going to be near you. And you pick one. And then you go to that church. And if you go to that church and that church is healthy and doing great, then God has blessed you in a special way. If you go to the church and the church is in the midst of conflict, God has put you there to help bring peace and you stay. If you go to the church and the church is wavering from some of its teaching, then God has brought you there. To remind them of the truth that they hold on to. And you stay. That is so different from our thinking. But what this mentor was expressing is exactly what Paul is teaching in these passages. This is God's work when he brings people together and he points, appoints people to be a part of a community of believers, not for their purposes, but for his purposes. He is the one who builds the church by placing people in them. The closing verses are about our work. Our work is expressed starting in verse 28 with this long list of spiritual gifts. These are abilities that God gives us and God gives to different people to empower them to help the church reflect Christ to one another into the world. And I don't think this is all of the gifts. I think this is just part of the gifts. But the point is that everyone who has the Holy Spirit in them, which means every Christian, everyone who is a follower of Christ, has been gifted by the Holy Spirit in some way. 
Our work is to use these gifts that God has given us to help the body of Christ be healthy and to reflect Christ in our community. I saw this in amazing, amazing ways this past week. We had people from the Encore ministry volunteering at VBS. These are folks who could have looked at, at what they lacked and said, you know, we just don't have the income that some do. We don't have the energy that we used to. Besides, I have done this for so many years in so many different places. I've put my time in and just stayed at home. But that's not what they did. They looked at what they had, a schedule that might be a little more flexible than others, and said, I can give that as my gift, and I can serve. An encore family stopped me at lunch last week and gave me another example. They're at a point in life where it's harder for them to care for their yard in the way that they would like to. But there's another FBC family, a young family that lives right up the road. And the young family saw the need. And they said, you know what? We've got the equipment and we've got the kids. <laughs> and they've stepped in and are helping that family take care of their yard. We have people who would be terrified to stand up on this stage on a Sunday morning. That's not their gift. But they come into our office faithfully and help with administrative work that would drive me crazy. We have others who drive vehicles whenever it's needed. The body of Christ cannot function if people look at what they do not have and cannot do and then stop there. The body of Christ functions when those in the church remember that God gave them something and placed them in a church to use what he has given them. God is building a radical oneness in his church, in this church. He is the composer. He is the one who places people. Our job is to resist the mindset that threatens oneness. The attitude of they don't need me or I have nothing to offer or we don't need them. Then we get to work using the resources that he has given us. Not worried about what he hasn't given us. And we use them wherever he has placed us. How does that work at FBC? What does the body of Christ look like here? I want to make two observations. Really two challenges. First, use the diversity that God created in FBC as an opportunity for oneness, not division. Take a deep breath. I'm going to say something very countercultural. Um, and it may cause you to throw things at me. The body does not exist for the parts. The parts exist for the body. Think about Paul's analogy. The body does not exist so it can have a hand. The body does not exist so it can have a foot or an eye, or an ear. The hand exists to help the body function and to be healthy. And many churches and many people in churches turn this around and act as if the church exists for the sake of the body parts. And that would exactly be getting wrong, turning it upside down, what Paul is trying to say in these verses. If you think that the church exists for its parts then diversity is going to threaten you and you will resist it. I have never, ever once in my life met a foot who is okay with the body spending money on a hat. Never once. Not in any of the feet that I've talked to. <laughs> what the foot wants are better socks and better shoes. To a foot, a hat looks like a waste of resources. And there are a lot of things that happen in a church and that happen in this church that one part of the body might not benefit from. And they are tempted to say, what a waste. That particular part might not look, might not like how we do something or what gets done. 
But what if we approach things that are outside of our preference with a mindset of, this isn't what my body part likes, but I will support it because it is what is best for the body. Many things that divide us would start to bring us together. I'm just going to go for this one. Um, this is one of the reasons I am very, very, very hesitant about doing a contemporary service and a traditional service. I think Paul would look at that and say, you are taking the diversity of your church and you are dividing instead of uniting. I'm not saying I could never be talked into it. I just think it makes us guilty of the exact things that Paul is warning us against here. Um, I think what Paul would be delighted in seeing, I think what the Lord would be delighted in seeing, is us saying, that's not my kind of music, but this is good for the body, and I'll rejoice in that. Second, let me challenge you to get involved. There are numerous ways for you to get involved right here. Are you administratively minded? Lord bless you. We have needs. Do you love to teach? We have needs. Would you rather just be by yourself and work in a garden? Guess what? We have needs. Maybe what you have to offer is a flexible schedule. We have needs. The church has people in it with needs. The church itself has needs. God has gifted you with something. You have something to offer this church, and it is needed. And it's needed right where God has placed you. Use the gifts that he has given you where he has placed you. God is appointing, he's composing, he's arranging the local church to be the body of Christ. We are the local representation of his character and his presence in the world. So is Moberly, so is Longview Missionary Baptist, so is New Beginnings. We are all in this together. We are made up of a diverse set of people. And we are all tempted to think that we don't have a place or that others don't have a place. But every one of us has a place right here because they have been placed here by God with unique talents and abilities and personalities and resources. The point Paul is making and the point of the message is this. Contribute where you are with what you have. Mr. Potato Head is not a bad picture of the church. As long as we remember who's actually putting it together. If we think that it is our job to design Mr. Potato Head, we will make him look just like us. And that's what we tend to do in churches. And the problem with that is that when it comes to the church, is we are only one part of the body. And we will make it all a foot or all an eye or an ear or at least all comfortable for that. And that might make us comfortable, but it won't make us effective. Paul reminds us that God is the one appointing and putting us together. And that means we will be made into his image. We will be a radical oneness formed out of diverse parts that represents the presence of Christ in our community. That is what he is building at FBC. So how do we respond? It is really fascinating to me that 1 Corinthians 13 follows what we just studied. We tend to look at 1 Corinthians 13 as the passage about marriage. Do you see that that's not its context? Nothing wrong with using it for marriage. Its context is how do we relate to one another as the church? So my challenge to you this week is to go read 1 Corinthians 13, not in light of romantic relationships, 
but in light of how we relate to one another in church. Man, encourage someone this week. I heard wonderful stories. I was blown away by the story of this family who has just reached into the life of one of our Encore members to say, we can help with that. But you know what? Sometimes that family itself needs to hear it. And I'm sure that they have from this couple because I know this couple. But man, if you've got something like that that you see or that's happening in your life, be an encouragement to how Christ is evident and working through them in your life. Pray for how the Lord wants to use you. Instead of focusing on what you do not have and what you cannot do, focus on what God has given you and ask, Lord, these are the gifts. The, I, I may don't even know what my gifts are. I just feel so limited. God, open my eyes, show me. And then serve. Get plugged in. It's not wrong to say serve at FBC because this is exactly what Paul is talking about. He was saying, get plugged in and serve, you Corinthians, at the Corinthian church. And so our application of that would, would naturally be to get plugged into the body that you are a part of. I want to um, make it easy for you to say, I do want to get plugged in. And there's a, a place for you to fill out information saying, you know, I want to get plugged in. I don't know how. Or I really am interested in this ministry. I love to garden. Tell me what to do with that. Put that on the response card. It's on the tear off in the bottom of this thing. And there are boxes in the foyer to the right or the left. And let us help you get plugged in. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. We're going to close in prayer. Why do we need to pray? We need to pray because our temptation is to fight for a church that looks more like us than it does like Jesus. God, give us the humility. Give us the vision to desire a church that looks like Christ and not like me. So if you're on the prayer team, would you come forward and why don't we just stand and close in prayer? These folks are up front to pray with you, no matter what your need is. If you do not know Jesus, who empowers us, who gifts us, and who unites us, allow us to introduce you. Let's pray. Father, we confess that the desire for comfort, the desire for what is familiar, is so strong that sometimes what we want is for the body of Christ to look like us instead of looking like Christ. Lord, make us aware when we are being tempted along those lines. Make us aware when we are giving into that temptation. Lord, help us to have a vision that goes beyond ourselves and our own comforts and our own desires, Lord, to what you desire, to what you are building, to what you are doing, to what it, for what it means to have a community look at us and say, look at those people and how they relate. Truly, Christ must be present. Lord, that is what we desire. But we are easily tempted. Help us, Lord. Help us today. Help us this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What have we said about who our God is? We have said this. God is building this body because he has put you here with your own set of gifts and contributions. So our challenge is to leave here and use them. You're dismissed.